Hey guys, it's Dr. McJunkin. Welcome to week four of virtual learning, your last week of calculus, because next week will be the AP exam, and we are not doing any work after the AP exam. So last two lessons to get us ready for the AP exam. Before I get us started on particle motion stuff, I um, just want to let you guys know I posted a lot of information and stuff under um, on Google Classroom. Under AP exam info and practice, there's like a little demo for you to practice uh, submitting your work so you don't freak out um, when you get to the actual exam time. Um, and there's some practice uh, problems that uh, practice tests that College Board is also putting up there on YouTube. So uh, go ahead and check those things out. There's lots of good information there to make sure that you're ready to take this test next Tuesday at noon. Oh, so excited. Okay, so lesson seven, we're going to review some particle motion uh, problems here. <clears throat> the biggest thing to review and remember is that position, velocity, and acceleration are all connected through derivatives and antiderivatives. So if you take the derivative of position, you get velocity. If you take the derivative of velocity, you get acceleration. If you take the antiderivative or integral of acceleration, you get velocity. And if you take the antiderivative of velocity, you get position. So they're all related through integrals and derivatives. First thing I want to go over is direction of motion. So a particle with positive velocity is going to be moving up or to the right, depending on the problem. Positive velocity is up or to the right. A particle with negative velocity is moving down or to the left, depending on what the particle is doing. And so based off of those, positive and negative velocities being different directions, a particle changes direction whenever its velocity changes sign. This happens any uh, this could happen anytime velocity equals zero um, because the particle has to stop in order to change direction. So we would look for where the particle stops and see if we can look at um, where its velocity changes um, from positive to negative or negative to positive. So let's look at this first example here, this word problem. A particle is moving horizontally, so left and right, along the x-axis for t greater than zero. A particle's, the particle's position is given by x of t equals t cubed minus 6t squared plus 9t minus 4. At what time does a particle change direction? Well, if I'm looking for changing direction, I need to be looking at my velocity. So I need my velocity of the particle which is just the derivative, or x prime, of t. I'm just going to take the derivative of this position function. Well, this is a pretty easy polynomial. I get 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. And I want to figure out where that equals 0, because the particle has to stop in order to change direction. OK, to solve this quadratic, I'm going to factor it. But what I want to do first is divide everything by 3, so I can easily factor this and get rid of that 3 out front. So what I really have is t squared minus uh, 4t plus 3 equals 0, which factors to t minus 1, t minus 3 equals 0. So there's two values that I'm looking at here, t equals 1 or t equals 3. Those are places that my velocity stops. So I want to then look at my velocity along a number line. And the places where it equals 0 are 1 and 3. So that's where it could change direction. And I want to see what's going on in each of these three intervals. To the left of 1, is it going right or left? Between 1 and 3, is it going right or left? And when it's greater than 3, is it going right or left? Because at these two points, it's stopped. OK, so I just plug values in each of these intervals into my uh, velocity equation. If I plug in 0 into my velocity equation, I get 9. So I get a positive velocity here. If I plug in 2, I get negative 3. So it's negative here. And if I plug in 4, I get 9. So it's positive again here. So if I want to label this, here it's moving to the right, here it's moving left, and here it's moving to the right. <clears throat> So at both of these locations, 1 and 3, I see that my velocity changes sign. I move, I change from going right to left, I change from going left to right. So at both of these places, at t equals 1 and 3, is where the uh, particle is changing sign. 
Oh, I don't really have space for that. So I'm just going to go ahead and highlight it here. So at both of these places, I change sign because my velocity has changed. Excuse me, I, I changed direction because my velocity has changed sign. Let's look at my a graph of velocity and see if I can, how a graph helps me as well figure out where it changes directions. I have a graph of velocity. Always when I'm looking at a graph, I want to know what is it graphing? Is it graphing position, velocity, acceleration? I want to know. And I want to know when it changes direction. So again, that's when my velocity changes sign. This is the graph of velocity. So graph of velocity is positive up here. My velocity is above the x-axis here, so my velocity is positive right here. My velocity then goes to zero at that point there, uh, one, it goes to zero. And then down here, maybe I'll use my blue pen again. Down here, my velocity is negative. So I change direction right here. Change direction right here. And maybe I'll just say this is zero equals my velocity. So I don't think that's like the point. At the point t equals one, my velocity is zero. Well, where else could I change directions? I see right here, my velocity is zero as well. On this side, my velocity is positive. And on this side, my velocity is negative because it's below the x-axis. So I'm not looking at position here. I'm looking at velocity. My velocity positive above the x-axis, velocity negative below the x-axis. So I can say that I change direction also here. So I can say I change direction there. So I might just write down here in my little space, particle changes direction. Particle changes direction at t equals one, this one right here, and t equals four because Velocity changes sign. Great. Let me go ahead and move that up so you can see a little bit better. Oh, too much. Too much. Uh, perfect. No, no, not perfect. Great. Okay, so my particle changes direction at one and four because that's where it changes sign. It's where it's crossing the x-axis, basically. When I'm looking at a graph of velocity, I'm really just looking at where does it cross the x-axis, where one side is below the x-axis and one side's above, or vice versa. Cool. So it changes directions two different times. Let's talk about average velocity and acceleration and instantaneous velocity and acceleration, because that can be confusing to lots of people. So average velocity and acceleration, whenever I'm being asked for an average, I don't need to use any calculus. Average velocity and average acceleration is just a slope. So if we want to find the average velocity, that's a change in distance over a change in time. So like distance would be in terms of like say feet, time would be termed in terms of like seconds. And so when I divide feet by seconds, I'd get a velocity, feet per second or miles per hour, some distance per some time. The average acceleration is a change in velocity over time. So velocity would be maybe in something like miles per hour, MPH. Time would be an hour. Now we get miles per hour squared as some accelerations units. So when you're thinking about finding the average of each of these things, you actually go one, uh, one of the objects above. So if I have average velocity, I look at a dis difference of positions, not a difference of velocity. If I want the average acceleration, I find a difference of, or a slope between velocities, not accelerations. So if I wanted to find the average acceleration of a particle on the interval one to two, again, I need an interval because I need to find two points for the slope. It's just a slope formula. I wanna find the average acceleration of a particle given that its velocity function is this. Okay. So if I want to find the average acceleration, so A sub AVG average, well, that is going to be a difference, uh, a slope between the two points of velocity. So velocity evaluated at two minus velocity evaluated at one. These come from my uh, endpoints here, divided by two minus one. We're not given any kind of units, so we're just going to look for a number here. 
If I evaluate this function at 2, I got 28. Minus evaluating this function at 1 should give you negative 3. Divided by 2 minus 1, well, hopefully that's 1. So then really it's just 28 minus negative 3, or 28 plus 3, or 31. Units would be some kind of distance per time squared. So meters per second squared, or meters per second per second, uh, feet per second squared, miles per hour squared. It would have those kinds of units. So the position of a particle moving on a straight line is given by this crazy position function. At what time is the instantaneous velocity equal to the average velocity on this interval? Let's first figure out what the average AVG, the average uh, velocity of this, oops, not acceleration, average velocity. My average velocity on this particular interval is my position at 1 minus my position at negative 1 divided by 1 minus negative 1. Okay, so if I do that, my average velocity should end up being negative 2. My average velocity should end up being negative 2. You get fractions here to be negative 5 halves minus 3 halves over 2, and that becomes negative 2 here. What is my instantaneous velocity? Instantaneous velocity I need to use calculus for. Instantaneous velocity is the actual derivative. So my instantaneous velocity at any time t, not just the average between two points, but at any time t, is just the derivative of my position. So that's 2t over 2 minus 2. These cancel out, and I just get t minus 2 for my instantaneous velocity. So I want to know at what time t is this. Let me get a different color, because why not? At what time t is this equal to this? When are they equal? Well. This is a very easy equation to solve. When is t minus 2 equal to negative 2, if I add 2 to both sides, well, that happens at my t value of 0, right at the beginning here, or right in the middle of that interval. At t equals 0 is when the average velocity, which was the difference in position, that slope formula, which I didn't even need calculus for, when is that equal to my derivative at any point? Well, at 0 is when the instantaneous velocity and the average velocity are the same. OK, let's talk about speeding up, slowing down, and then a couple acceleration examples to wrap up for today. So a particle is speeding up if its velocity and acceleration have the same sign. Both velocity and acceleration are positive, or both velocity and acceleration are negative. They're, the velocity is moving in the same direction as the acceleration. The acceleration is making the velocity go more positive or more negative. A particle is slowing down if its velocity and acceleration have opposite signs. So one's positive, one's negative. I'm going to look at this graph again from last time. And I want to look at this velocity again. I want to know now, when is the particle speeding up? When is it slowing down? And when does it have zero acceleration? This is a graph of velocity as a function of time. This is the graph of velocity. I'm actually going to start the, on the last question. Where does the particle have zero acceleration? Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So what I'm looking for is when do I have uh, a slope of zero on this graph? Because the slope of this graph is acceleration, because it's a velocity graph. The derivative of velocity is acceleration. So the slope of this velocity graph is acceleration. And I see that right here and right here, I've got slopes of zero. I've got horizontal tangent lines. So I'm going to start by saying my zero acceleration happens when t equals, yeah, it's about 0.5. I'm going to round to 0.5. And this one's about 2.9. So I have zero acceleration. At these two points here, I have horizontal tangent lines, the slope is zero at that point. Let's think about speeding up first. 
So I want the same size. So when I'm looking at speeding up here, I'm looking at when do velocity and acceleration have the same sign. At the beginning, let's start kind of like do interval by interval. Right here at the beginning, my velocity is positive. We saw that earlier. My velocity is positive from here all the way to one. And my acceleration is the slope of this, which means, am I increasing or decreasing? My slope of this line is positive. It's an increasing function. So the slope is positive from zero all the way up to 0.5. So at this point, my velocity is both positive because I'm above the x-axis, and my acceleration is positive because it's increasing. It's going up. It's got a positive slope. So between 0 and about 0.5, I'm speeding up because my velocity is positive and my acceleration is positive. Basically, I'm above the x-axis, and I'm an increasing function. Here, when I'm looking at this portion from here to here, this is not going to be speeding up because my velocity is positive, but I'm a decreasing function now, so my acceleration is negative. So let's go ahead and start a slowing down portion down here and write that. From 0.5 to 1, my velocity is positive, but my acceleration is negative because my function is decreasing. So I've got a decreasing function, which means negative acceleration, but I'm still positive in accelerate or still positive velocity. Down here, I'm gonna color this orange, like the last one, because I'm gonna be speeding up here. Why is that? It looks like I'm going down. Why does it mean I'm, mean I'm speeding up? Well, my velocity is negative because I'm below the x-axis. My velocity values are like negative 2, negative 3, and negative 4. And my function is decreasing. So my acceleration is negative. So it's speeding up because from, uh, sorry, 1 to 2.9. Because my velocity is now negative, I'm below the x-axis. And I'm decreasing. My acceleration is also negative down till I get here where I'm at zero acceleration again. This next piece is going to be slowing down, which again seems counterintuitive because it looks like it's going up. But again, this is a graph of velocity, not position and things like that. So why is this slowing down? Well, my velocity is negative. I'm still below the x-axis. So my velocity is negative here. But my acceleration is positive because I'm starting to speed up. Sorry, I'm starting to slow down. Whew, that was confusing. So my acceleration is positive, but my velocity is negative. I'm getting closer and closer to a velocity of zero. That's one other way that you can figure out this a little bit, is when I'm getting closer to a velocity of zero, that means I'm slowing down. Up here, I was going from about a velocity of one down to zero. I'm slowing down. Here, I'm going from a velocity of negative six back up to zero, so I'm slowing down again. So my velocity, negative, acceleration positive from that 2.9 to four. This last piece here, I'm speeding up again because I'm getting away from zero. I have a positive acceleration, positive velocity. So four to say infinity, velocity is positive, acceleration is positive again. Cool. So I got three speeding up intervals, two slowing down intervals. Uh, the zero acceleration kind of breaks up my intervals, and also the zero velocities break up my intervals. Cool. And look, it's a nice color, too. Why not? OK, last acceleration examples. Uh, if I want to find the acceleration of a particle at time t equals 3, when the position is given like this, well, should be pretty easy because I know that acceleration and position are related by uh, second derivatives. So if I have my position here, I'm going to start by finding my velocity equation, which is the derivative. So the derivative of this, pretty easy, 20t cubed minus 30t squared plus 14, taking one derivative. My acceleration is then the derivative again. 
60 t squared minus 60 t. And then if I just want to evaluate it or find it at time equals t, t equals 3, I just evaluate. So 60 times 3 uh, squared, which is 9, minus 60 times 3. Again, the t is just 3, so I squared it already. And this should give me about 360. Again, I don't have units, but it could be like meters per second squared, feet per second squared, miles per hour squared. OK. Let's talk about, lastly, the maximum and the minimum acceleration of this particle. It's going to go back to what we were doing a little bit last week with the max, uh, finding local maxes and mins. But I want to find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum here of the particle from this last problem on the interval 0 to 2. So I want to find the highest and lowest points of this function here, this acceleration. So let's go ahead and just rewrite the acceleration as 60t squared minus 60t. Recall, when I want to find the max or min of a function, I need to take its derivative, look for critical points, and test those values. So I need the derivative of acceleration to figure out where its critical points are, where it could possibly have a max or a min. Taking the derivative, I get 120t minus 60. And I want to know when that's 0. When do I get a critical point? 120t equals 60, so t at 1 half is a critical point for me to test. If I also want to find any absolute maximums here, like the, the maximum and minimum acceleration of this particle on, the, on this interval, I need to also check the endpoints too. So what I want to look for is I want to test the acceleration at the endpoints, 0 and 2, but I also want to check the acceleration at 1 half. So I want to know what's the acceleration at these three places. If I plug this back into my acceleration formula up here at the top, my acceleration at zero is pretty obviously zero. My acceleration at one half, you should get negative 15. And my acceleration at two is 120. So notice it's asking me what the maximum and minimum accelerations are and not where they occur. So I want to say my max acceleration so my max acceleration is 120 and i'm going to say my minimum acceleration the minimum acceleration is negative 15 because it wants me to know what the actual max and min acceleration are not where they occur my minimum occurs at one half my maximum occurs at two but they wanted the actual acceleration values. OK, so that was a lot of review on particle motion. Next time, we're going to wrap up and finalize uh, calculus review with uh, differential equations. And then the test is next Tuesday. We're almost there. We've got it. Um, feel free, if you've got questions on this stuff or any of the calculus stuff, to email me from 9.30 to 11.30 today. Or come by, stop by office hours from 2.45 to 3.45. Hope to see you there. You guys got this. Um, review any material you have. Um, have all your materials ready for the, the test. You know it's going to be online. So it's open note, open uh, book and everything. So make sure you have all your resources. You won't have a lot of time to reference them. But looking at them beforehand so you can review those materials will be great. OK, I will see you guys next time on Friday. Bye.